I'm going to delve deep into how a the Google phone can still run regular apps even though there's no Google Play on the phone. The secret is a framework called Micro-G. Without Micro-G, many apps intended for the Google Play Store will not work on a the Google phone. What exactly is Micro-G? How does it work and how can it protect you from Google tracking? Some phones using Android open source project do not install Micro-G. If your phone does not have Micro-G, how do you add it? Does installing Micro-G make your phone less safe? How do you configure Micro-G correctly? A lot of questions here and I have all the answers for you, so stay right there. I'm on the platform odyssey.com. I'm now a top creator on there. In case I get the platform, please follow me there using the link in the description. My company sells privacy products like Bytes VPN, a metadata free email Braxmail, and our new product is the Brax2 privacy phone that can shield you from Google and others. Brax2 is now available on Amazon and also on my app Braxme. The links are in the description. If you've gotten a Google phone from me, you will know that you are able to install apps that are typically found in the Google Play Store. And because of this, a the Google phone becomes close to being as functional as any normal Google Android. This is important to get more people into using a safer phone. There is no Google Play Store app on a the Google phone. In fact, there is no Google app of any sort. But you're able to install some apps that are typically found in the Google Play Store. Examples are popular apps like Spotify, Netflix, Signal, Telegram, Zoom, and so on. To allow you to find popular apps, we pre-install an alternate store called the Aurora Store, and there you find the usual apps that one would see on a regular Google Android. But simply giving you access to the apps on the Google Play Store does not ensure that the apps you download will work. Most apps published on Google Play Store are built to use some Google services. One of the most significant Google services used by most apps are notifications. An app that is designed to use Google notifications have to hook into a Google service that allows it. Another example of Google code that some apps require is geolocation. Apps that need the Google version of geolocation or maps will also fail if it doesn't find that Google service. A software developer has the option of designing their own methods for doing notifications or using some alternate method of providing a geolocation feature. But many will use the native support provided by Google services because it makes app building easier. For this reason, a Google Android is not just what's visible on the user interface. There are a lot of services provided that apps hook onto, and we software developers call them Google software libraries. I'm just going to call them Google libraries. These Google libraries are closed source and proprietary, meaning we can't see what code Google puts in them. What is interesting is that in a the Google phone, those Google libraries are removed. So there is a complete absence of any of these common libraries to do things like notifications, geolocation, app telemetry, and even advertising. In a nutshell, Micro-G is a replacement. It basically spoofs the original Google libraries and Micro-G does in fact talk to Google to allow certain services. And this is where the question of Micro-G safety comes in and which we will discuss near the end of the video. If certain apps were built to use Google libraries, they may crash if they can't find them. But if you install Micro-G, the apps think you do have the Google libraries, so they continue to work. That is the main function of Micro-G. Not all apps intended to work on Android work the same way. For example, if you install apps from the independent F-Droid store, then those apps are designed to never use any software library from Google. Because of that, F-Droid apps have the least amount of tracking. So if you have a choice to get apps from F-Droid versus getting them from the Google Play Store using the Proxy Aurora Store, then F-Droid apps are safer. As an example, you can get apps like SyncThing, K9, Email, DuckDuckGo Browser, Conversations app, to name a few, from both the F-Droid Store 
and the Aurora Store. Those coming from F-Droid have no Google related code whatsoever, while those coming from Aurora Store may have some associated Google code. Usually the only Google service these apps will utilize are notification. The MicroG project is open source and is maintained by a developer named Marvin W from Germany. You can actually see the code for MicroG core services, which is written in Java. I've checked out the source code and it gives me a better understanding of what MicroG is actually trying to do. MicroG does in fact allow some Google services to work as usual. In some cases it tries to make it work, but it doesn't always succeed. And that's because the MicroG team doesn't always know what Google is doing inside this library code. And in many cases, MicroG just provides a stub or dummy function, meaning the Google service can be found by the requesting app, but it doesn't actually do anything. However, acting like a service exists prevents apps from crashing. Here is a complete list of features provided by Google services, and you can see which are supported by MicroG and which are not. I'm going to regroup this so it is easier for us to visualize. First, we'll just show the Google services that are in fact supported by MicroG. The critical one that is used by most apps is Firebase Cloud Messaging, which is the notification support. Believe it or not, this is really the most critical feature that most apps use. Surprisingly, the library hook to Google Drive is supported, but I don't encourage you to use this feature since it will connect you to Google. Now here's a list of features that are not supported at all. Many of the other features are specific to specialized apps. As an example, the technology for wearable hardware, game libraries, fitness, and auto are not supported. So clearly without Google services, apps that use these features will not work. That's why a de-Google phone cannot run Android Auto, for example. Here's a third category. Here are services that we don't want and are intentionally not supported by MicroG. But you can see some immediate benefits here. For example, MicroG does not provide support for geofencing, nearby, mobile ads, and Google Analytics. So by design, the dangerous Google services are not operational and are just stub functions. Depending on the app developer, if an app cannot find a Google service, it can choose to ignore the absence and run like normal. If an app did not plan on it and it is critical to the use of the app, for example, if the app is supposed to support wearable hardware, then the app will crash. Many apps will not fail, for example, if the mobile ads do not show up. But some apps won't want to lose revenue from ads, so they specifically stop if this capability is not on the device. There are really very important benefits using MicroG on a Google phone versus using a standard Google Android, which we will delve into later. But just looking at the list of supported services will already give you the hint. By the way, clearly MicroG has to communicate with Google in some way, and thus some people claim this makes your phone less safe. And we will discuss those risks later after I explain the MicroG features. Of course, you can have a more locked down phone using only apps from F-Droid and without the presence of any communication with Google as provided by MicroG. This means that your phone no longer behaves much like a regular Android. And though this is fine and is a more advanced use, it means you have to forego using some common apps that can be important to your privacy. For example, apps like Signal only work with Google services. This, by the way, is also related to the use of the Aurora Store. For the Aurora Store to give access to Google Play Store apps, it also has to communicate with Google. So you can consider this problem as being affected by these two apps. How do you install MicroG? First of all, MicroG is intended for the Google phones. MicroG will not be able to replace the Google libraries on a standard Google Android phone since those are system files. It can replace those files on the Google phones because the libraries are not there. You can install MicroG by downloading the files 
from microg.org. The two most important apps from microg are Services Core, which is com.google.android.gms, and Services Framework Proxy, which is com.google.android.gsf. Notice that both files have a Google name. That's because they are intended to appear like Google to the apps that need the Google services. So those apps will attempt to find these Google programs and they will find them. However, they're not the original Google files. They're obviously the ones provided by MicroG. These two files are the ones needed by most apps. The services framework proxy is designed to support old apps that do not use the newer Firebase notifications called GCM. So the real one that is important is just the first app, but I tend to include the GSF file in case some older app needs it. If you've downloaded this app to your phone, you click on them and they will install. By the way, on Brax2 phones, MicroG is a system app and it cannot be installed or uninstalled since they are part of the OS. This is also the case with some OSs that are shipped with an integrated MicroG like Calyx OS or eFoundation. Also on Brax2 phones, MicroG is accessed through settings system. It does not appear with app icons. You can disable MicroG on a Brax2 phone though by turning off all the switches that we will discuss later. However, MicroG is a library of services, so if no app is calling those services, MicroG is not used anyway. When I look at the libraries included in the MicroG services core, I see other libraries that indicate support for wearable APIs and even Mapbox to handle Google Maps version two. But in reality, it is clear that those are not ready for prime time and don't work. For example, in my experience, no app works with Google Maps. Now let's look at how to configure MicroG. The most controversial feature of MicroG is the necessity to allow for signature spoofing. The problem is that Google, of course, made the original apps that provide Google services. And now MicroG is replacing those apps with a non-official version. Google services apps installed on Android have a signature check to see if it is the original one provided by Google. MicroG has to override this signature since, of course, the Google Play services are not the original. I'm not sure there's a way around this. If this bothers you, then you should not use a device with MicroG and limit yourself to F-Droid apps since only those apps will work. But if you want to use apps from the Google Play Store, then we have no choice but to accept the signature spoofing. By the way, Brax OS has signature spoofing enabled. Lineage OS does not have signature spoofing enabled. In reality, both phones function for the most part, but some apps may check for app signatures and then shut down if it detects a mismatch. This is part of the Android safety net, which we will get into in a moment. Here on my version of MicroG on the Brax OS, you can do a self-check to see what has been enabled on this version of MicroG. These are not settable, by the way. These just show you how the MicroG install is set up. Now let's talk about the settings you can set on MicroG and what you should do on each in normal use. Under the heading Google Services, there is Account, which is used to add a Google account. I have no interest in ever adding a Google account as this would invalidate the purpose of a de Google phone without an identity. But this could enable support for some Google services that MicroG does support, for example, like Google Drive. I would never suggest that you try to turn this on. There is a risk that it may compromise the identity of the phone, so ignore this setting. Next is Google device registration. This gives the phone an Android device ID, and if you click on it, you will actually see the identity given. 
This device ID is generated by Micro-G, so it is not a hardware identifier. A unique device identity is needed to be able to direct messages to this phone from the Google notification server, for example. This device identifier is long-term, so it is of some concern. Again, we will examine the risk of this when I analyze the risks of Micro-G near the end of the video. You will need to allow this if you wish to use notifications. Yes, it is safer to not enable this, but you will not get notifications. Next setting is cloud messaging. Cloud messaging is the notifications infrastructure called Firebase GCM. If you want to get notifications, you enable this feature. You actually turn this on and off each time you enable notifications for a particular app. The next setting is Google Safety Net. Google Safety Net is a Google service which uses intelligence to determine if you are a real user of a real device or if you are a fake user. This is used by some apps to see if the device has been hacked in some way or if someone is spoofing the device when using an app. The value of this is again app specific. I presume certain apps like banking apps will also use safety net. Some common apps like Snapchat for example check safety net. Micro-G will attest that the device is certified with safety net but it doesn't actually perform safety net tests. To enable this requires an app from Google itself which is Droid Guard Helper and this poses the next big question. Safety net means you let Google's fingers into the phone to track what apps you have installed and it will discover if you have a de-Googled phone. I found that in practice, safety net fails on most de Google phones anyway. In fact, all phones from Huawei will fail safety net because there's no Google code. So in reality, many apps are pulling back from too much of a tie-in to safety net. The last setting on Micro-G are the location modules. In theory, this requires installation of a backend module to handle locations. And I have not installed anything and most things still work. Frankly, I have not found any specific need to use this. The de Google phones handle location without any specific setting required for location modules. However, clearly there is no provision for Google Maps version 2, which I believe this is used for, but I haven't gotten Google Maps support to work on some apps that need it, so I just assume it is one of the things that will not work too well on a de-Google phone. If someone can tell me how to get this to work, I'd appreciate it. Now let's talk about the safety of using Micro-G. There are several holes in Micro-G that allows Google some insight into the phone, and we need to analyze the risk involved with each. The first risk comes from notifications and the required Android device ID. Although the Android device ID is not tied to hardware and is generated by Micro-G, the problem is that it is a semi-permanent identifier. The only way to change this is to regularly uninstall Micro-G and apps and then reinstall everything so that a new Android device ID is generated. In the case of phones with integrated Micro-G, you'd need to do a regular reset to change the Android device ID. This ID is needed by Google to provide access to Google Cloud Messaging, which is the framework for notifications. And that makes sense. You need to be addressable as a unique device to get notifications. So is this dangerous? I've thought about this and I've concluded that the risks are minimal for notifications as long as there is no Google app on the phone. The reason is that although Google can somewhat identify the phone, there is no app on a de-Google phone that can report actionable data to Google. The data is related to the specific app using the notifications only. For example, there is no way to link that Android device ID to what you do on YouTube. There is no 2FA on the phone that can link to that as well. Now on a regular Android, the notifications can be tied to a Google ID and this Android device ID, plus it knows everything you do on a Google app. So from my analysis, there is little danger to this semi-permanent identifier from notification. Still, Google knows the device is active. If you really want to disappear from Google's eyes, then do not enable notifications 
on any app. That really affects the functionality of the phone, so it is not recommended except in really extreme circumstances. The next big issue of MicroG is related to safety net. Again, let me delve deeper into Google safety net so you can understand the value of this. One of the ways safety net works is by getting a signature of the OS to make sure it is a valid OS as known to Google. This is already a problem here because if we let Google know the device signature, it could detect that this is not using a standard Google Android. Thus, unless this OS signature is spoofed or we can register the OS with Google in some way, we already have a failure in safety net. The next way that safety net works is to see if the standard security features of Android are enabled. The main module that secures Android is called SE Linux. Some routing tools will disable the strict control of SE Linux and allow some rogue apps to run. I would never suggest modifying the settings for SE Linux. So here, this is not an issue for app safety on a Google phone. We must leave SE Linux with full functionality. The next thing that SafetyNet does is acquire a list of all installed apps on the phone. This includes their signature, their version, their SE Linux status, and this is all sent to Google itself for evaluation. Google maintains a list of rogue apps on their servers based on detection from the Google Play Store, and it will auto-quarantine dangerous apps immediately. Although this sounds like a good thing, it means that Google always knows what apps you have on your phone at any time. So this is a version of a Google Police. The last big feature of safety net is that all links are cross-checked by Google. This way, Google auto-blocks any link they think they need to block, if the link, for example, links to malware. But by the same token, a link could be blocked for censorship reasons. This is like a form of DNS blocking, but even more specific since it is the actual specific link. Do I want Google to interfere with links I click? Of course, there's a cybersecurity benefit to that, but the censorship capability is worrisome. So these are the main functions of safety net. All in all, most Google phones will likely fail safety net anyway, so this becomes a moot point. But in order for safety net to work properly, you have to put in the actual Google proprietary code and have it sit on your phone. This app is called Droid Guard Helper. This is a Google service, so it's tantamount to putting back some Google service which is monitoring apps and links on your phone. My conclusion is that for a Google phone to be safer from the big G, we need to disable safety net regardless of the potential support of it by micro G. The effect of this is that some apps won't work like Snapchat, like some banking apps. For those, use a browser. Let's keep Google out of the picture. If you keep safety net out of this, then MicroG should be quite safe in my opinion. However, the risk of installing rogue apps with malware becomes your responsibility. So don't be installing unknown apps from unknown locations. Stick to the well-known apps and you should be fine. I don't know how much time the developer Marvin is spending on Micro G, so at the moment it gets the basics done, which is primarily notifications and prevents apps from complaining when the apps call some other functions. I think we need to support Marvin with donations so that he continues this very important project. Without Micro G, it would be hard to make the Google phones functional in the absence of the, the real proprietary Google services libraries. In summary, MicroG is more important for what it doesn't do than what it does. It provides stub functions for things that apps might call so they don't crash. But it will not provide functions like advertising, geofencing, Google Analytics, and all the other bad telemetry that will occur with a real Google service library. In case you have problems with apps that should normally work, often it is because the MicroG settings have been changed or MicroG was removed. Many apps detect the presence of Google services on install. So if the Google service did not exist at the time of install, then the app will lock at some features. 
So before you start installing apps, make sure your Micro-G is configured the way you want, and then install apps. Otherwise, delete the apps and reinstall them again. This will allow them to detect the presence of Google services. Now caution, many apps like Signal will say, this app requires Google services. These apps may be testing against the Google services library for a specific function to ensure it is the real Google services library. It appears to be a standard message from Google. In most cases, you will find that most apps only use notifications, so you can ignore this message. Some apps like Uber, Lyft, Postmates, and others that require payment will not work at all. This is because there is no wallet interface in the Google services, so it can't deal with anything that requires payment. But not to worry, sites that require payments like Uber, Lyft, and Postmates can still be accessed via the browser on a Google phone, just like some banking apps. Unfortunately, we are all being forced to rely on big tech for everything we do. Apps like MicroG are here to allow us some options. It is not perfect, but without it, we are left with no choice but to have continued spying on our activities. Thank you for watching and see you next time.